not start for them even. And when we were interested in it, which is the year 1945, uh, the population of Old Quinton is 493, uh, all nestling at uh, the foot there of Neon Hill, as you see on the map. Uh, Neon Hill on a sunny day. And that's an aerial view where you can hopefully make out the, the earthwork indications of the Iron Age fort that, that used to be up there. But since I got interested in this case and story, um, I often find myself thinking about the ancient Britons who, who lived up on the top of uh, Mean Hill at one time, uh, painting themselves with wood, mourning about the price of magic mushrooms, <laughs> wanted to take back control. <laughs> so that kind of stuff was going on back then. But in the 1940s, uh, Lower Quinton looks like this. That's a view from Friday Street in the centre of the village. And this is our murder victim, Charles Walton. Charles Walton was born in Lower Quinton. He lives there his entire life. He's married, he's widowed. He works all his life as a farm labourer uh, in the Lower Quinton area. And even into the 1940s, when he's only 70, he's very badly sort of almost crippled really with rheumatism, etc. He still continues to do a bit of farm labouring. Uh, from what I can work out, not really because he needed the money, uh, so much as it's the thing that he knew, it's the thing that he'd always done, and he just liked to, to still get out and about in the fields and do labouring when, when he felt up to it, when the day wasn't too bad, stuff like that. Unfortunately for Mr. Walton, um, he goes off to do a bit of casual farm labouring on Valentine's Day, 14th of February in 1945, sets off from the village early in the morning, heading for a field that's on the approach up to Neon Hill where he's going to do some hedge work uh, that particular day. Unfortunately, and as the forensics and pathology later reveal, Instead of doing a, a sort of pleasant day's work out in the fresh air, uh, Mr. Walton is murdered sometime between 1 p.m. and 2 p.m. that afternoon. He's actually killed with his own uh, work tools. And you can see in this fairly grisly crime scene photo, you see, yeah, you see, <laughs> you see the Haycroft and the trenching hook, as they called them, that he'd taken to work with them. And it looks very much as, as what the killer's done, as he's, he's pinioned Charles Walton to the ground with the hayfork, kind of in the neck area. And then, very gruesomely, he hacks and so on away at the torso, scratching and cutting. Um, and so basically what happens to Charles Walton is he dies from the trauma and from the massive sudden loss of blood. It's a really, really nasty, out of the blue, unanticipated crime. How it unfolds on the day, as I say, he's gone off to work, happily enough, we assume, uh, that morning. Doesn't return at his usual time to the village in the evening, and some people start to be concerned about where he is, particularly his niece, uh, Edith. Little search parties put together, and around about seven o'clock in the evening, they find the body in the field where Charles had been working. Obviously, the police are called, and the crime scene photo you see there is actually taken at midnight uh, on the 14th of February uh, by police flashlight. Um, and obviously, the police take this case extremely seriously right from the very beginning. It's, you know, your own reaction for the shows. It's a very gruesome, very, very horrific uh, crime. And the police do over the next 48, 48 hours or so exactly what you expect them to do. They are looking for evidence, they're looking for clues, they're looking for witnesses, and they do all the standard 
uh, police came a stop when you would do at such a crime scene. And they are taking it uh, very, very seriously. It's a, it's a hideous crime. And they basically don't get anywhere with it in those 48 hours. No suspects healthily appear, no arrests are made, anything like that. And what kind of makes it a bit worse, really, for the local police is that because the crime is so horrific, and even though, you know, this is wartime, 1945, the case fairly quickly becomes a national news story. This is the Daily Mirror on the 16th of February, the front page, so in amongst all the stuff about what's happening in World War II, you get police hunt maniac killer of man and bitch. So the story has sort of big media coverage, uh, more or less straight away. Um, but this maniac killer theory is kind of like the first assumption that the police make. Again, because it's such a horrible and, and unexpected killing, there's a thought that maybe there's a maniac on the loose somewhere. There isn't, as it turns out. And also, as it turns out, the police continue really, the local police continue to get nowhere with the story. And it's often happened that this time in police history, when local police aren't getting anywhere with a difficult case and when there's media interest and so on, they would tend to call in Scotland Yard from London to see if Scotland Yard could come in and, and uh, make some headway with the case. That's ex exactly what happens uh, on this occasion. Robert Fabian, and we'll say more about who Fabian is later on, was brought in from Scotland Yard also on the 16th of February, along with his entourage of skilled murder detectives, the hope being that he can take over the case and get much further than the less experienced local police can. And as he says later in his autobiography, um, by the afternoon, Fabian and co. had brought the 20th century to Lord Clinton like a, like a cold bath. Fabian very much saw himself as a modern scientific type of detective. He was always very keen to use the latest technology, <coughs> the latest scientific discoveries to help him with his investigations. And he certainly does this in Lord Clinton. He gets the RAF to fly over the area, make very detailed aerial photographs of the crime scene and the surrounding area. He brings in the Royal Engineers and he sends them out into the field with metal detectors because there's a theory that there's a missing watch and that maybe there's a robbery motive for the killing, so the engineers are trying to detect that. Lots of samples and clothing, etc., are taken and they're sent over to Birmingham to the laboratory of Professor Webster, who's one of the leading forensic scientists uh, at, at this time. And beyond all that, Fabian and his detectives interview, and sometimes interview a lot more than once, everyone in the village and everyone in the wider area. He put in really a month's worth of very, very solid detective work, uh, using all the best methods available to them, but just like the local police, they get nowhere with this case. Nobody comes forward with incriminating witness testimony. There's no suspect strong enough uh, to make an arrest on anything like that. So when we get into March 20th, 20th of March 1945, the case effectively, the murder case, original case, comes effectively to an end. There's an inquest held in Stratford, returns a verdict of unsolved murder by persons or persons unknown. Fabian goes back to London, the local investigations wound down, and the press lose interest because there's nothing else, effectively, nothing new coming in to, to report after that point. It's worth saying, uh, before I move on, that uh, Fabian did have a suspect at this stage, a man called Alfred Potter. Now Potter is the farmer for whom Charles Walton work, was working on the, the last day of his life. And again, he's interviewed on several occasions by the police and there are various inconsistencies in his alibis and his accounts of where he was and the times of the day. 
So all of this made him a, a little bit suspect uh, to Fabian. And um, Potter is really the only person at the inquest who's subjected to any level of hostile questioning. Um, but again, there is no hard evidence, there's no evidence of a motive, no witness testimony, absolutely nothing to put Alfred Potter under arrest. So he's exonerated, and as I say, the inquest reaches no conclusion. And at that moment in time, the murder story kind of just disappears. And uh, the papers get back to uh, reporting what's happening in Europe in 1945. And maybe that would have been where the story ended, except five years later, in 1950, we start to get this kind of thing in the press. So we're no longer, as you see instantly, talking about maniac killers and a horrific murder, but maybe one that had an mundane motive such as robbery and so on. We're now moving into this witchcraft occult theory of Charles Walton's death. This is based on an interview with a lady called uh, Dr. Margaret Murray, who I'll say more about who she is in a moment or two. But the story that she just kind of pops up and tells everybody in 1950 is very different from the police investigation. Uh, Margaret Murray, put it, put it in a nutshell, she has what I've come to think of as a wicker man thesis about Walton's death. She asserts that there are witches and witchcrafts still current and active in the Lower Quinton area, and that Charles Walton is the victim of a blood sacrifice. Effectively, he's, you know, he's been killed in a field so that his blood will renew the crops and renew the soil and make the whole traditional Wicca man uh, style. She doesn't give a shred of evidence any kind of concrete empirical uh, kind for these claims. She simply asserts this as her theory as to what happened in Lord Clinton. She explains that absence of hard evidence away by saying the villagers are too frightened to talk. They all know about witchcraft, they all know what's happened, but they're not going to say anything, they're too frightened. It's um, an entertaining story. The issue, I think, uh, and the point, maybe from our point of view uh, right now, is why suddenly in 1950 the press decides that this is a theory worth reporting on and, and publicising. And to know about that, we have to know a little bit more about Margaret Murray herself. I think that's her, her famous studio portrait there. Very interesting woman in her own right. Somebody should do her bravado on her one, uh, at some time or other. Um, early in the 20th century, she was an Egyptologist. So she, her background is in archaeology. And in the early part of the century, she's involved in a lot of the famous excavations out in Egypt, looking at uh, ancient uh, Egyptian artifacts and so on. But into the 1920s, well, really, into the 1930s and 40s, she kind of somehow loses interest in Egypt, and she turns her attention to medieval Europe, and her idea that in medieval Europe there was a widespread pan-European witchcraft religion that you can still find evidence for. Um, it's fair to say that a lot of her theories have been subsequently very, very challenged by, by more recent uh, historians and researchers. But in the 30s and 40s, Margaret Murray is a very eminent, very well-known scholar, and her opinions are taken very seriously by a lot of people. <coughs> uh, particularly, she writes a book, The God of the Witches, in 1931, which is a big seller, and Pound's personal witchcraft thesis. He's in particular very influential on this chap, Gerald Gardner, who is still revered uh, to this day as one of the founders of the modern uh, Wiccan religion. Um, and he, in turn, is, is influenced by Murray. This is his uh, famous book, Witchcraft Today, from 1954. And as you can see on the screen, 
uh, his book benefits uh, by uh, having a nice introduction from Margaret Murray on it. So Margaret Murray's big news. That's why the papers are prepared to, to carry her uh, witchcraft, seat, uh, witchcraft thesis uh, about Charles Walton's novel, without any evidence, just from assertion. And one of the effects of that, unsurprisingly, is it kind of opens the floodgates to others to take the case away from being a mundane but unsolved horrid murder into this realm of the occult and metaphysics and witchcraft, etc. It kind of opens the floodgates to all that stuff. So this is uh, from a Birmingham paper in 1952, Seance Planned on Murder Sites. Uh, and what this one's about is the, the Psychical Research Society. They came up with an idea that they would go to Meon Hill at midnight on the 14th of February. They would take a medium along with them. The medium would go into a trance, communicate with Charles Walton in the afterlife, and Charles would tell us all exactly the details of who killed him and everything else. As far as I can uh, discover, this seance never actually took place. It would appear that they could never talk a medium into doing exactly <laughs> what it was they wanted. But nonetheless, the story speaks volumes about this new interest in the case. It's no longer just some mundane murder. It's now you know, a, a subject of sort of occult speculation. Um, and so it goes, really. It's also, it doesn't, from that point of view, hurt the story that Charles is murdered on the 14th of February, Valentine's Day. So if you have a slow news day throughout the 1950s, the 60s, and into the 70s, it's a lovely little feature to run in your newspaper, looking at the Valentine's Day murder and the witchcraft aspects and, and all that kind of thing. Um, for example, one of the classics, <laughs> The Daily Mirror, 1954. And what they do here, uh, they rehash all of Margaret Murray's theories in, in this little feature, and they then put into it a whole load of uh, local Warwickshire mythology and folklore and legends, and it's all this nice occult uh, mixture. Headless dogs, also headless ladies, and in all seriousness, uh, one story of a headless dog that turns into a headless lady. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, very entertaining. The papers are loving this kind of stuff. And these stories, as I say, recur throughout the, the 50s, 60s, and 70s. Um, Fabian himself helps the story along. In his autobiography, which comes out in the mid-50s, um, by which time he's a kind of 1950s celebrity type of guy. The BBC have made um, uh, you know, a series of dramas based on his uh, cases. He's been on Desert Island Discs, things like this. In his book, uh, Fabian says, well, I don't really believe all these occult stories. But he then goes on to tell you them anyway, <laughs> help spread this story, and he also has an actual downright porky of his own in there. He says in there that there's an ancient stone circle next to me and Hill, uh, and the one he specifically mentions is this one. These are the Wolbright stones. You've never, the great me megalithic site, if you've never visited, well worth the visit. But the Wolbright stones are not close by me and Hill, as uh, Fabian says in his book. They were good 18 miles away. <laughs> so in the 1940s and in the centuries before then, it's a day's walk, a day's long walk to get from one to the other. So it's a kind of false association he's making. I'll skip through uh, a few of these next slides. There's a whole lot of detail in this story that I just don't have uh, the time to cover. As well as uh, newspapers, it also took book form. That's a classic from 1968 recounting uh, all the various theories and adding one of its own in, which is this idea that Walton ha had a cross carved into his chest. Well, he didn't. There's nothing in the pathologist report. Colin Wilson, another interesting figure who I can't really spend too much time on at the moment. 
rather cool looking intellectual chap as you can see there, I wrote a best selling book about French existentialism, The Outsider, still in print in 30 languages and all that. He's also a guy interested in crime and the occult and in many of his books, and he's again a big writer in the 60s and, and 70s, he also references uh, the case as, uh, as being an occult um, witchcraft type case. And it would be nice to leave the story at that point. Um, it would suit the timing very well, for one thing. <laughs> however, however, somebody got very, uh, got very irritated and invented a thing called the internet. Um, and so, having it's kind of like a slow motion fake news story. That's what I, I tried to show you. You've got the real life murder, which probably got a mundane explanation, which is very horrible. And then people get into all these daft witchcraft uh, explanations for it. The internet comes along and exactly the same happens again. This time much more quickly on the World Wide Web. The story is there from day one of the internet. There's blogs, websites, message boards, and more recently lots of YouTube videos, etc. So the story is still current and there are some splendidly objective features on this on the internet, but 90% of it is just retelling the old Margaret Murray story and actually in a much more outrageous way, much, much more ridiculous than, than she uh, ever propounded. Um, and that's it. Murder story translated into witchcraft, fake news, or at the very best, unproved news story. Why do people love it? Why are people still interested in it? There's your man to go to if you want to ponder that question. And also in the 40s, Orwell's decline of the English murder essay, where he basically explains that there's something going on in human nature uh, with this kind of case. The more embellished, the better. In his days, you might read it in the news of the world after a nice Sunday lunch. Nowadays, we might find something on Netflix to ponder along these lines. It's something about being safe and cosy yourself while someone else is having danger and non-safety and there's something in human nature that we frankly just enjoy about that. Uh, we enjoy it maybe from Netflix, people in the 40s read the Sunday tabloids and I expect, and I'm going to leave it there, but back in Neon Hill, in ancient Britain days, they were telling similar exaggerated stories uh, around the fireside. So, sorry, I won't. No, it's a very good day.